Hello there my fellow notebook aficionados and welcome back to the channel. Today we finally have the first laptop in the studio being powered by Nvidia's new Blackwell laptop architecture and we are going to start off big with one of the most exciting notebooks we have seen at CES 2025. This is the refreshed Razor Blade 16 and while the matte black beauty might look very familiar at first glance, a lot has actually changed. Obviously, it comes with Nvidia's latest and greatest for laptops, the RTX 5090, but contrary to its predecessors, this one is being powered by AMD, with a 2024 Strix Point CPU beating at its heart. And while Razer increased the thickness for its last gen plate 16s to accommodate more powerful components, the 2025 model has been put on a significant diet. I have been quite vocal about my concerns here, since a slimmer chassis usually means either lower performance, louder fans or more heat, and sometimes even all free. But while this one is not completely free of compromises, Razer did a very, very fine job of balancing everything. Yes, the Blade 16 will not be the fastest RTX 5090 laptop out there, nor will you get the lightest 16-inch performance notebook or crazy long battery life. But you will get a little bit of everything and the amount of computing grunt Razer has been able to put into such a slim chassis without a significant disadvantage is actually pretty impressive. And what about the mobile RTX 5090? Well, you have to manage your expectations here about what a new architecture can do on the same process node and with the same power envelope, or even less in the plate. But we do get a solid uplift in performance in addition to all the new features we have already seen in the desktop counterparts. So without further ado, and since we have a lot to talk about, let's get into it. Before we get into all of our performance testing, let's have a look at the plate as a whole. As I have already mentioned, instead of Intel's HX CPUs from last year, we get Team Red's Ryzen 9 HX370. And I am very torn about this decision right from the get-go. Sure, it enables the thinner chassis in the first place, since it simply needs less wattage. And spoiler alert, battery life has also been improved, but more on that later. But the decision to opt for AMD here also means less CPU performance in general and soldered RAM. Do not get me wrong, this will most likely be more than enough for the average user. However, since this is also a great machine for content creators or workstation users in general, it's a bit of a bummer, even though it's a necessary compromise for the downsized chassis dimensions. And while we are at the subject of upgrades, you can still very easily get inside the 16 inch and adding a second NVMe is still possible, which is at least something. The display experience is also almost on par with last year's version with slightly reduced brightness results during our measurements. Apart from that though, you get the same OLED eye candy we know and love with very accurate colors, amazing contrast and excellent response times. PWM is also quite high for the self-emitting display tech and as a creator, I am always very happy about the additional color presets which make the blade an excellent companion for creators. Circling back to the plate itself, well, it's a Razer laptop. While this means you have to wipe it every 5 minutes to maintain the super clean look, build quality leaves absolutely nothing to be desired, with pretty much no chassis flex all around and very well adjusted hinges. The port layout and selection is basically copy and paste from the 2024 variant, but why change what works? And with a pair of USB-A 3.2 Gen 2s, the power connector, an audio port and the first USB-C 4 on the left, and the second one and an additional USB-A next to the HDMI 2.1 on the right. Add in the full-size SD card reader with snappy transfers, equally solid Wi-Fi rates and a standard gaming laptop webcam, which means it's not very good and you get pretty much everything and then some in a very clean looking and well-made chassis. While the massive touchpad seems to be the same as what we have seen before and therefore delivers the same experience, Razer did put a lot of work into the new keyboard. You get quite a bit more travel and great tactility, which definitely elevates your typing experience tremendously from the previous version, even though I would say the competition, most notably the Cephas G16, is still better. But it turns the keyboard from a potential deal breaker for some into a not quite ideal situation, which is definitely a step in the right direction. I personally would have no problem driving the plate here daily, but I'm also getting used to keyboards quite quickly, so it's not a huge issue for me. Alright, that's that, so let's talk about performance. 
As per usual, we did some initial testing to give you guys an overview about what to expect from Razer's performance profiles, which you can select in the Synapse software. We decided to do our testing in the performance setting to get everything the new core components are capable of. Kicking things off with our CPU rating and you definitely get a performance hit from the change to AMD's 12 core Strix Point Silicon. It's not massive and again it requires quite a bit less energy to still deliver some pretty impressive performance figures. And the argument how much CPU performance you really need these days is still very valid, but as we will see later in our gaming results, you will be able to feel the less powerful CPU even in the real world. System performance leaves nothing to be desired, but the difference to last year's competition is also pretty much non-existent. But our scores here are usually very close in our PC mark results. In the real world we also experience nothing but a snappy experience, no matter what you are doing with the plate. And thanks to the much more portable form factor, the 2025 variant is a much more flexible daily driver, be it for gaming or content creation, as a desktop replacement or as an email or Netflix machine when out and about. But of course, the star of the show today is definitely NVIDIA's new mobile flagship, the RTX 5090, with its pretty insane 24 gigs of video memory. And I teased it before, this will not be the fastest variant of the new silicon, so please make sure to subscribe so you won't miss our upcoming coverage for Team Green's lineup. We have a lot of new laptops in the pipeline and you would definitely not want to miss those. But keeping in mind the new chassis dimensions, the slower CPU and the reduced wattage and our results are actually looking pretty alright. We get a solid lead over last year's Plate 16 and pretty much the same results as from the Neo 16. And both of these laptops drive their GPUs with the full 175 watts, so it will be very interesting to see what a 5090 with the same wattage and either Intel's new HX CPUs or AMD's Fire Range Silicon can do. Unfortunately, content creation applications show pretty much the same performance in Blender for example, which is actually a bit odd to be honest. There's a small lead in Photoshop, even though that one is not using the GPU a lot to be fair, and a small but measurable lead in Premiere. If you are into AI, on the other hand, you might want to keep an eye out for this one. If our Procyon image generation runs are any indication, the performance uplift is much more pronounced here and it seems like the new generation of Tensor Cores is doing the work. You should also consider the much, much larger video memory, which is definitely a big upgrade, especially when working with AI applications or if you are a CGI artist, for example. As a video editor, it is also very welcome for me personally, since even with a laptop 4090 16GB, our footage could easily fill that up without a problem, which can result in stuttery playback, which you can only get rid of by restarting our video editing software of choice. So while render times might not be much faster on the plate, the VRAM definitely makes my editing workflow a lot smoother and much more efficient. But let's talk gaming. In our performance rating, our scores might seem a tad bit disappointing, but once again you have to put them in perspective since we test our standard games in 1080p to stress both the CPU and GPU equally and you simply see the influence of the former a lot more here. That said, the results are definitely not bad per se, especially considering that the 5090 runs with around 130 to 140 watts here, when the Strix Point Silicon has something to do as well. As soon as you get to QHD though, the story changes and the plate sits atop its last gen competition. Not with a huge lead, but again, considering the chassis dimensions and comparing it with similarly thin notebooks like the Sephiroth from last year, I would say Razer's engineering is quite impressive. These are our results for all the games we tested and the plate can definitely handle almost anything you can throw at it in QHD and the majority of games even in 4K, despite the fact that we are talking native rendering here for the most part. Of course, Nvidia's next-gen mobile GPUs come with a few aces up their sleeves, which for gamers is definitely upscaling and multi-frame generation. And to really compare the generational uplift here, I did not only put the Razer against its direct predecessor, but also against the Blade 17 with a 3080 Ti, since this might be a more realistic upgrade path for the majority of you guys. I know frame generation has sparked a few discussions in the past, but the numbers here definitely speak for themselves. And very much like I mentioned in our RTX 5090 desktop experience video from a few days ago, I stand by my opinion that while it does come with some compromises, it's a great feature to boost your FPS, especially in laptops where you simply cannot pump more power into a GPU. 
So let's kick things off in Cyberpunk 2077 at the Blade 16's native resolution of 2560 by 1600 and in the ray tracing overdrive setting, which means full path tracing. Rendering everything natively easily doubles the 5090's FPS versus the 3080 Ti's with a small lead over the 4090 despite the newcomer's lower wattage. Of course, even 23 FPS is hardly something I would call playable, but with DLSS in its quality setting, things certainly look better and in the performance setting, things are starting to get quite playable. While I did not do any in-depth comparisons between the two DLSS models, on the relatively small 16-inch screen, even DLSS performance looks really good. So if you either want to forego frame gen completely or get a higher base FPS to begin with, it's definitely more than usable. Talking about frame generation, well of course the 3080 Ti does not support the AI tag, while the 4090 gets the uplift in average FPS we already know. Surprisingly, even sticking to 2x FG on the 5090 gains us a much bigger delta compared to the DLSS only settings. And going up to 4x, which means 3 completely generated frames between each real rendered frame, well, who would have thought that you can enjoy this game in these settings with 150 FPS on a laptop anytime soon. Again, it looks and feels great to me. And as I already told you guys in our desktop 5090 review, the image definitely appears to be a little blurrier during faster movements, but I think that's an acceptable price to pay for the much smoother feel. And I also did not experience any latency issues, but this might of course be a bit more subjective. Alan Wake 2 pretty much tells the same story, with both the 4090 and 5090 doubling what their aging predecessors could do with similar power while delivering almost the same numbers themselves despite the 5090's lower power draw. With frame gen, we see once again a bigger improvement for 2x for the 5090 while getting about 160 FPS with 4x frame gen is simply bonkers. And since you will most likely play this one with a controller, I would once again argue that any potential latency issues that might arise are a non-issue. I know this is all very subjective, but I would still urge you guys to try it out for yourself. DLSS and FrameGen might not be the be-all and end-all features, but they allow us to experience amazing visuals in modern games with very, very playable frame rates. As per usual, it's a bit of a compromise with some trade-offs here and there and varying by game. But in my experience, I rarely encountered anything that would break the gaming experience for me and I gladly take the extra frames instead of having to turn down any settings or lower my render resolution. As I mentioned before, when you slim down a laptop's chassis, you usually expect either higher temperatures or louder fans, and sometimes even both. And well, yes, kinda. The blade is definitely audible, and when you're plugged in, you can almost always hear the two fans, but it's just a soft hum that rarely left me distracted. Under load, it gets audible, but I would say it's in line with last year's model, despite the slimmer chassis and basically the same performance potential. But as always, please hear for yourself. And if you want to get more raw data about the blade, please head on over to our written review. We have a lot more information, for example, about internal or external temperatures, which are a bit higher than in last year's model, but still within reason, or things like stress test behavior or our measured noise results. In addition to allowing a slimmer chassis, the Ryzen CPU should theoretically also help with battery life, and it definitely did. 
While about 8 hours in our Wi-Fi test is not that great for notebooks in general, it's pretty much class leading when we talk about similarly powerful 16 inch laptops, even though Apple's latest MacBook Pro 16 is still very much out of reach. And just as a side note, and please take it with a grain of salt since it only happened a few times and only during my time with our sample, while it was completely fine during our test runs my colleague did, I experienced the Ryzen throttling to just 600 MHz while being on battery, which made everything I attempted to do very, very sluggish. But again, it only happened a few times and I would assume there is a software issue somewhere and after this video and our testing is done, I will reset the machine and report back to you guys if the problem is solved or persists or even gets worse. Alright good people, this is the all new Razer Blade 16 with the Nvidia RTX 5090 and I must admit, I was very, very skeptical about it. I still do not agree 100% with the design decision to slim down the chassis and downgrade the CPU to get there. Especially since it means less performance in some areas and gets a soldered memory. But you also do get a lot in return. First of all, the new plate is much more portable and it's still quite crazy to pick this one up and put it into perspective with how much performance slumbers beneath the melt-black surface. As per usual, the Razer is exceptionally well made and has an understated look that will be appreciated by gamers and workstation users alike. And with the improved keyboard, amazing screen and very practical I.O., the 16-inch presents itself as flexible as ever with a wide range of potential use cases. And then there is the 5090. Yes, as a whole, the Blade 16 is just marginally faster than its predecessor. But again, it's a lot slimmer, so I'm still quite excited about what a full wattage 5090 can do. And while you could argue that we do not get a lot of generational gain in raw computing grunt, with the added 8 gigs of video memory and additional features, the Blade is a very attractive, if pricey, option when shopping for a premium performance laptop in 2025. That said, if you already own a 2024 model or if you are able to get one somewhere, it's also a very viable option. But please let me know what you think about the new Blade 16. Do you appreciate the thinner chassis and longer battery life or would you rather just get the old chassis back with a faster CPU, full wattage GPU and all the upgrade options from before? As always, please sound off below, I cannot wait to hear what you guys have to say. That should also be it for today. Again, please make sure to hit that like and sub button. It not only helps us quite a bit to grow the channel so we can keep making these videos for you, but you also definitely do not want to miss our upcoming coverage. Thanks a ton for watching, folks. My name is Alex, you have been absolutely fantastic and I cannot wait to see you all in the next one. Take care.